Welcome back. Okay, we're talking about hypothesis testing in statistics, which is this notion that you can ask a very specific question, did something change in my distribution, in, in my distribution of data or of some process that I'm monitoring? And we can test that hypothesis and actually give a, you know, a number to how confident we are that either nothing changed or something changed using this notion of hypothesis testing. So the procedure, and I gave an example last time, um, I'm just going to recap the procedure here and talk about a few more kind of details and subtleties. The basic procedure, um, let's say that you have some, uh, you know, medical treatment, some, some new wonder drug, you have a control group and a treatment group, and you make a, a hypothesis that this drug is effective, let's say then your null hypothesis would be that there is no change in the treatment group having the, the drug. And your alternative hypothesis is essentially that something did change, that your drug was effective. So your alternative hypothesis is the thing that you want to actually prove if you think you have this, this wonder drug. And so what you do is you establish a null hypothesis. It's basically the, the straw man or the counter argument. Maybe nothing changed, and your observed results are just the product of statistical fluctuations and variations. You know, there's randomness in the world. Maybe your observed outcome is just, you know, uh, within the expected range of variability you would expect in a statistical process. That's the null hypothesis. So the procedure here then is you assume the null hypothesis is true. Remember in probability, it's a lot harder sometimes to compute the probability of something, and sometimes it's easier to compute the probability that that thing is not true. That's what the null hypothesis is. So we assume that the null hypothesis is true. Um, this is still from my last example where we had uh, the website data. So you assume that the null hypothesis is in fact true. And then what you do is based on your observed data from this, this treatment group or, or, you know, kind of your new observed data after you think something has changed, you define a test statistic of the observed change, um, like the, the, the new data. For example, in this case, I'm assuming maybe um, the average value of something has, has shifted because of my treatment or because of my manipulation, then I would take my observed average X bar, my, my data from this new um, modification, minus the expected average given that the null hypothesis is true. If I assume the null hypothesis is true, then I assume that my expected average is the same as my previous um, average or the average of my control group. And I divide that by the standard error, um, which is a quantifiable, calcu uh, a calculatable quantity. This is essentially the sample standard deviation from the, the treatment group or the, the after manipulation group divided by the square root of the sample size um, of that, that group. And essentially what this does, we know that let's say we're trying to you know, detect that there's a change in the mean or the change in the average value. That's, that's like the most common uh, one of the most common things we would test with a hypothesis testing. We know that the average value of this sample is a normally distributed random variable because of the central limit theorem. So if I subtract off the mean and divide by the standard deviation or standard error, I should recover this variable z called my test statistic, and it should be a normally distributed random variable with mean zero and standard deviation one. This is a very, very common thing we do is that we subtract off the mean, divide by a standard uh, error for a normal distribution to turn it into the standard unit normal form. Because here, now, if z is particularly large, we can quantify how big it is in terms of standard deviations or standard errors away from this expected average, assuming the null hypothesis is true. Okay, this is recap. We, we've done an example of this in the last in the last lecture. So, and this is from actual, these are numbers that you compute. X bar is data, standard error is from data, the expected average is either um, some previous knowledge about your previous distribution or it's data you collect from a control group. So you can compute all of the terms in this equation here, okay? If I was being really clever, I would have made this one pink and this one pink and this one blue because um, this is my treatment group, treatment group and control group, um, but you get the picture here. 
and we compute this z value. Okay. Now, Z, if we think that the average, if we think that the you know, average health outcome or life expectancy or whatever, if that mean or average value moved, we, let's say we, we expect this to increase. We think that our drug was successful. So some average value of some quantity increases in my treatment group. Then we would, um, we would see a Z value ideally that's to the right of zero. That would be an observed increase in the, the, the mean value after this treatment. Now the null hypothesis says that nothing changed and that that was just random fluctuations. And so the real question is, if I observe a Z value here, let's say that this is my Z value. If I observe some Z value, I actually run the numbers and I get a Z value, let's say it's like two, I get a Z value of two. So my observed mean is two standard errors away from my you know, null hypothesis mean. How likely is that to happen? How likely is the null hypothesis to be true? How, uh, how much do I believe that this observed uh, Z is just the product of statistical fluctuations and my null hypothesis is in fact actually true? So the way we ask this question is, how small of a Z value of, um, of Z do we need to reject the null hypothesis? How small of z would reject the null hypothesis? Okay, and we'll remember the p-value is the area to the right of this um, this z-value in this uh, standard unit normal cumulative uh, uh, probability distribution. And P is the probability that the null hypothesis is false. So P is the probability that, it's the probability that Z is um, greater than or equal to this value. Maybe I'll put, um, maybe I'll make this an alpha. Okay, this is some alpha. P is the probability that my Z value is greater than or equal to some alpha, okay? And this is also the probability that my null hypothesis is true, okay? So given the data, um, this P value is kind of my best estimate of the probability of my null hypothesis being true. So if P is like 0.1, that means that there is like a, you know, a 10% chance that the null hypothesis is in fact true. And that is too inconclusive. I can't make a decision based on that. Like a one in 10 chance that, that my results were the product of randomness is not necessarily enough to act on. But if my P value was um, 0.05, that would say I'm 95% confident that my null hypothesis is false. If P is 0.01, then I'm 99% confident that my null hypothesis is false. So that gives me some way of asserting a statistical confidence that either my null hypothesis is or is not true. That's what the P value is useful for. And small P values make me more confident in rejecting my null hypothesis, in asserting my alternative hypothesis is in fact statistically likely. And so you have to determine that p-value cutoff ahead of time. You can't just run your experiment, look at the p-value, and then decide, oh, that's good enough for me. You have to go in with um, a predetermined value of p that you're willing to live with um, to trust your alternative hypothesis. Okay, so you essentially, um, you know, for example, you choose p equals 0.05 as the uh, rejection criterion. This would be the, the rejection criterion, as the rejection criterion, criteria. And what that means is that anything to the right of here, if my z is anywhere to the right of this alpha where p equals 0.05, or let's say, you know, 5%, if my z value, if my test statistic Z is anywhere to the right of this, this value, this um, you know, 0.05 P value, this is what's called the rejection region. And so 
usually what you do if you're you know, a good statistician is you design an experiment. You design an N, a number of people in the control group, a number of people in the treatment group. You design a hypothesis. You design, you, you specify a p-value, which sets up a rejection region. Then you run the test. You, sometimes you actually publish your protocol before you run the test so that everyone can keep you accountable. Um, and then what you do is you actually then run the test, you, you get the numbers, you calculate this test statistic, and you see if it's in the rejection region or not. If Z is in the rejection region, then you reject the null hypothesis and your uh, alternative assertion is probably true. And if Z is to the left of this alpha, then you cannot reject, you fail to reject the null hypothesis and your results are inconclusive. Okay, that's how this works. And so for this value of p equals 0.05, um, you can actually look up in your you know, statistics book or ask GPT or go to Python or whatever. You can figure out in a standard unit normal, what is the alpha for which 95% of the probability is to the left and 5% is, the right, is to the right. And that would give you a critical z value um, of z greater than or equal to 1.6 four, five, we're going to say standard errors. Okay, so if Z, this is your critical, um, critical value. So if Z is, if, if you collect your data, you run your test, this is your pink data, this is your blue data. If you calculate this Z value, you subtract off the expected mean, divide by the standard error, and you get this, this Z, which should be normally distributed, unit normal. If Z is bigger than or equal to 1.645, you can reject your null hypothesis with 95% confidence. If Z is less than this value, you fail to reject the null hypothesis. And if I set my p-value, my, my threshold p-value at 0.01, I need strong statistical significance, then my z would be even bigger. It would, I would need more standard errors to assert, to reject the null hypothesis with 99% confidence. Okay, that's how this works. So you can design um, these rejection regions and rejection criteria based on how significant you want your results to be before you make some decision or publish those results. And for some things you need, you know, really, really significant results. Medical, uh, some medical treatments, you need strongly statistically significant results. Other things that are less critical, you might be fine with 95% confidence. It depends on the application, okay? Good. Um, what are some other things I want to tell you? Um, this, example I drew here is based on my hypothesis saying something about the mean, the expected average of this distribution of these populations and having that mean change or increase. So in my website example, where I have a guerrilla marketing campaign and my website traffic should have gone up afterwards, I'm looking to see if my average website traffic before changed and increased. So if X bar, my observed website traffic after my marketing campaign is larger than my average website traffic before the marketing campaign. That's implicitly assuming, my, my alternative hypothesis is actually that my average increased. It's not that my average is different, it's that my average increased. And that's why we're looking for values of Z that are to the right um, of some alpha. If I, if my, my marketing campaign could have failed. Let's say that my marketing campaign was risky and I could have either been really successful or I could have totally pissed people off and driven my traffic down. Then my hypothesis would be slightly different. Then there is a chance that my manipulation could have actually made the, the mean lower than, uh, than before the manipulation. And in that case, we do something called a two-tail test where again, we still have uh, a z variable that is uh, Gaussian. We still compute the exact same z variable. It's still a Gaussian. But now we open up the possibility that we could have increased the mean. That would be part of my alternative hypothesis. But we also could have decreased the mean. This is also part of my alternative hypothesis. So this sets up a different rejection criteria if you think that there's the possibility that your modification could actually hurt or decrease your observed um, population mean or average value.
Um, this comes up in lots of places. This is actually one of the common ways people manipulate p-values is when they should have done a one-tail test, they do a two-tail test instead, and it makes it harder to reject your null hypothesis. Um, there are, you know, uh, stories of cigarette companies doing this in, you know, when evidence was coming out that cigarettes might not be healthy for you. The natural test would be, you know, that they that they actually hurt you, that the that there is a one-sided possibility that they have a negative health effect. If you open up the possibility that cigarettes could also improve your health outcomes, that creates a two-tail test and it makes it harder to reject that null hypothesis, especially when you have a small n. If you only have a population of 30, that change from a one-sided to a two-sided test might be enough to keep cigarettes you know, without warning labels for another couple of years. So two-tail versus one-tail tests um, are important. To, to know the difference. I'm gonna give you a couple of examples of how to compute this um, two-tailed test when the mean could be increased or decreased. So we'll see that in a little bit. For the case of you know um, an obvious marketing campaign, like I just paid for advertising and I expect my mean to increase, then a one-sided test um, is, is very reasonable. Other thing I'll mention, all of the tests I'm showing you, all of the examples and what I'm talking through here, is specifically for a hypothesis that my average value has changed, that X bar is different than, than mu, the, the pre-modification um, population mean. There are other hypotheses you can, you can test. This is what's called a simple hypothesis because I'm assuming a distribution and I'm assuming that the parameters are known. I'm assuming I know the mu, the average before modification. There are things called composite or complex hypotheses where maybe I don't even know what the distribution is or I don't know what the parameters are. Those kinds of questions would be like, you know, I just collect some data for heights of people in America and I'm asking the question, is this data normally distributed? Is it, you know, is that my hypothesis? Is this data set normally distributed? We would formulate that slightly differently. That would be a different hypothesis. We'd come up with a null hypothesis and we would test that in a different way. We would use something called the chi-squared um, test um, to see if, if a distribution matches another distribution. That's a different test. Um, this is a simple case where we're just tracking if the average value has moved. And so often when you're designing these, uh, these hypotheses, if you can formulate your hypothesis in terms of an average value of a population or some, some measured value, like the percentage of yield in a factory, you know, you want that percentage yield, that average yield to increase, then you can use this kind of simple hypothesis testing where everything makes sense and it's kind of easy. Okay, we'll talk about more soon, but that's what I wanted to show you for now. Thank you.